the rooftop of the world, the Arctic. I'm standing on the northern shore of Baffin Island, high in the Canadian Arctic. And this surely has to be one of the most inhospitable regions of the world. And yet, there are people who live here all year round, making their living from the wilderness. Baffin Island straddles the Arctic Circle. Winter temperatures plummet to minus 50 degrees. That's 30 degrees colder than your average home freezer. Yet for more than 4,000 years, people have lived from the land, using traditional knowledge perfected through generations. In this program, I'm going to be exploring the survival skills that have enabled native people to survive in the polar regions. Even here, modern tools of convenience, like the snow machine, are reaching in to change the way of life forever. 30 years ago, the Inuit people of Baffin Island were persuaded by the Canadian government to move into communities like Pond Inlet, where schools were provided. Now, although this modern life seems easier, it's expensive. Every nut and bolt has to be flown or shipped in when the weather is good. So most of the Inuit who live here must still hunt to feed and clothe their families. I've come here to hunt with them and learn the skills that their ancestors have passed down. The first thing that strikes anyone about this region of the Arctic is the sheer barrenness of the landscape. It seems incredible that any human being can live here at all. But like all wild places, the secret to survival is learning how to look into the wilderness rather than just at it. And the Inuit are expert. Here, every hunter must be able to navigate in a land where compasses can't be relied upon make water from a frozen desert, and most importantly, build shelter where no natural shelter exists. They use what's available, snow. Here it's two feet deep and hard packed by the wind so it can be cut into blocks. They look like polystyrene and they sound like it. Knack to this, and I haven't got it. <laughs> Better hide that one before the Inuits come back. That's more likely. There are no plans or even a tape measure. The size and the shape of the igloo is judged totally by eye. The first few blocks are the most crucial, and Ham Kadlu, the eldest and most experienced builder, lays them, carving with his snow knife. These knives used to be made of caribou bone, and although steel has replaced them, they're still treasured tools. away with the snow blocks, 
seating them in really carefully so that they lock tightly against each other as a ring of snow block spirals upwards. Each piece has to lock into three places. It's got a lock here at the top, at the bottom, and the other edge. So he makes his careful cuts as he goes, making nice surfaces to fit. Then he's going to pound it into place. Like that. OK, so the, the blocks are actually lodging against each other and holding themselves up. And of course, in the course of time, the ice crystals and the snow will stick together like super glue. When this is finished, you should be able to stand on top of it. It only took about 45 minutes for the three hunters to build this igloo, and they live in it while they're hunting on the ice. But in the past, whole families could spend the winter in one not much bigger. It's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> the skill of the builder is to make the blocks lean at just the right angle. And then, like painting himself into a corner, he ends up inside the igloo, having to cut himself out. Architecturally speaking, the igloo is the only arch in the world that can be built without an internal support to start with. While most traditional skills still have a place out on the ice, the Inuit way of life is changing rapidly, so that some younger people feel torn between the old ways and the new. Me, as a young person, I'm caught between two cultures, where my elders ex expect me to keep a culture alive, but I have, at the same time, I have to live uh, a modern life now. And nowadays, when snow machines and rifles are being used, everything seems to come so easy. But back when everyone used dogs and sleds and harpoons, then everything was difficult. Snow machines certainly have made life easier. These beasts can cover 150 miles in eight hours. That's three times as far as a dog team. They're expensive, but when you're hunting, machines don't bark or chase the caribou away. The Inuit have lived off the caribou herds for thousands of years, hunting for meat and fur. These days, many people can't afford snow machines or dogs, so Jayco will give away any spare meat. He has no understanding of people who hunt just for sport. Nothing, not even the caribou's body heat is wasted. Traditionally, hunters would take part of the stomach, fill it with snow, and stuff it back inside the warm carcass. Then they'd have something to drink when the butchering was finished. I'm cutting a leg now because uh, we got to cut the skin on the back of the bone because this for uh, like fur will be using for uh, caribou uh, boots. In two feet of snow, it's easy to lose things, so they stick their knives deep in the flesh. That way they know where they are. Despite the fact their hands are frozen, the Inuit are the quickest and neatest butchers I've ever seen. Butchering is hard work, and once you're dehydrated in the Arctic, you get cold very quickly. So it's vital to drink at every opportunity. 
The trick here is to suck the water through a fresh bit of snow, which acts like a filter. The first process in tanning a caribou hide is scraping. If that isn't done, the hide stays stiff and hard like this. And that would obviously be very uncomfortable to wear. To achieve a beautiful parker hood like this, which is soft and pliable, and like kid leather on the inside, takes an awful lot of work. Biting is the best way of making a good crease in the hide. Duatana here is sewing the leather with threads made from sinew. Now, the sinews are extracted from the tendons, which are the fibres lying alongside the back of the caribou itself. These have to be scraped clean of any flesh, dried, and can then be split down into the threads themselves. Now, believe it or not, these threads often last longer than the garments themselves. Pond Inlet is on the coast, but in the winter the sea freezes and open water can be up to 30 miles away. The best seal hunting is near that flow edge, but it's a dangerous place to be. Survival in this water is measured in minutes. Saltwater ice is deceptive. As little as four inches thick can hold a man, but how can you be certain? So how do you tell whether the ice is safe enough to walk on or not, Jacob? OK, uh, every time Inuit use a uh, hub phone for testing out the ice, this one is uh, it's not safe enough because I can hit it only once through the, right through the ice. So it's not thick enough to bear your weight? No. OK, something, something like this, uh, it's more white, it's more thicker. Thicker ice. Seals swim far under the ice in search of fish, using a network of holes to breathe. This tiny mound of snow marks the breathing hole of a seal. Jacob sniffs it for the telltale smell of oily fish, which shows this hole is fresh and still used. The hole is like the top of a tunnel coming up through the ice, so he checks to see what angle the seal will come up from. That way, he'll make a better kill. He will wait totally motionless in temperatures well below minus 35 for anything up to three hours at a time. His harpoon is at the ready. In Pond Inlet, modern harpoons are made of metal, but some hunters still know the old ways. This is uh, the antler from the caribou, or as the Inuit call it, the tuktu. Now, antler is incredibly strong. It's much stronger than wood, and in many ways serves the purpose for native people as plastic does in our society. So this is the piece that Jacob's sawn off of the antler. 
It's very hard. In fact, it's taken him about 20 minutes to saw it off. And he's going to use this to make a harpoon point, like this one here. The harpoon shaft is also made from antler. It takes days of carving and sanding to craft it down from the raw material. A small antler pin holds the shaft into a wooden handle. This is bound tightly with seal skin. Now you can see that the point is attached by this bearded sealskin cord in such a way that when an animal is harpooned, it comes off and toggles inside the animal. It can then be reeled in using this line. Hunting requires the utmost patience. Seals have many breathing holes and there's no way of telling when one will come up into this one. A hunter will stand totally silent on the sea ice but with seals alert to even the slightest noise, there is no guarantee of success. As night falls and the temperature drops still further, Jacob retreats to the small hunter's hut built on the edge of this hunting ground. He's waited four hours and caught nothing, but that's not unusual. I didn't catch a seal today because we'd been moving about near the seal hole for a long time. So I think the seal went to another area. The next morning, Jacob tries again. Time has little meaning on the hunting ground. He will stay as long as it takes to catch a seal. Nothing is easy in the Arctic. Going fishing in a freshwater lake means hacking your way through five feet of rock-hard ice. It takes hours of back-breaking labour. But when the breakthrough comes, it happens quickly. The Inuit fish with spears made from caribou antlers. Hooks are difficult to use in the extreme cold, and native people prefer efficiency to the subtlety of waiting for a bite. To attract fish to their spears, they use shiny lures made from walrus tusks, which they jig up and down with a patience that all fishermen know. With skill, spearfishing is an efficient way for one man to catch Arctic char. But if there's a team of men, they prefer to string nets under the ice using a clever device called a jigger. When we put the jigger under the ice, the, the metal here is dropped. When we pull on the string here, it goes like this. Let go the rope, the metal drops. We pull it again, and it goes like this.
after measuring my nets how long they are and I'll sink my jigger to the first hole once I have my jigger under the ice I'll start pulling on the rope and my jigger starts crawling under the ice if, if I have another person with me he'll be listening for the jigger crawling under the ice and once he thinks we can find it we'll locate it The water is so pure, you can see the jigger through five feet of ice. Now it's been found, all you have to do is dig down and retrieve it. We normally leave our nets down for six, seven hours or overnight. And sometimes we don't catch any fish. When we don't catch any fish, we either move the nets or set another net somewhere else. If I've left the nest down overnight in a good fishing lake, I'd catch about 30 or 40 fish. Their nets were down for two hours, and they have caught just four fish. The older fishermen accept this with ancient Inuit stoicism. But increasingly, the younger generation are questioning whether the old ways of life are truly worth the effort. Surrounded by a modern world with modern ideas, only a handful are choosing to learn the skills of their forefathers. This is an Inukshut. It's an Inuit symbol that says you can live here. Sadly, though, it seems likely that these stones will be standing long after the traditional skills of how to live here have gone. <laughs> 